Hello everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the best platform around for distance learning in business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks for our current Patreon supporters for making this video possible, and we would also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well, so please check the link in the description for more details. My name is Sava, and today we are continuing our discussion of the Phillips curve and the Chow structural break test, with regards to the relationship between inflation and unemployment. Phillips curve, just to recap, is a very influential uh, statistical finding in macroeconomics that shows that if inflation increases, unemployment is reduced, and vice versa. It has been used in macroeconomic research and policy making for decades now. However, there are substantial criticisms directed at its applicability, particularly since the 1970s. And in our past video, we have applied the classical interpretation of the Chow structural shift or the Chow structural break test to evidence that it might have been the case that the relationship between inflation and unemployment did change after the UK went off gold standard. To recap, we saw that if we select 1930 as our breakpoint, the natural rate of unemployment massively increases, uh, and uh, the model that estimates the Phillips curve on the whole sample is uh, subject to heterogeneity biases, and we evidenced that with uh, a p-value that was significant at 5% for the Chow structural break f-stat. However, another nice touch we have investigated is that 1930 might not have been the best year to select the breakpoint, because the f-stat for a Chow structural shift test was much higher in the 1970s or early 1980s, and there were also some notable local peaks after the First World War. So what is the best breakpoint that we could consider for our structural shift test? Also, what is interesting is that the main criticism doesn't hold true in the structural shift we have investigated. The relationship remains inverse and significant, as evidenced by the Linus outputs and respective t-tests, it's the natural rate of unemployment that shifts around. So maybe in one of the breakpoints that we would select today, uh, such uh, a finding would emerge. But to do that, we need to consider another way of the implementation of the Chow structural shift test that uses multiple regressions and dummy variables. So here, we should start with doing exactly the same thing as in the past video by estimating the full sample linear regression, regressing the dependent variable, that is unemployment, onto the independent variable, that is inflation. And we need the constant here to estimate the natural rate of unemployment or the non-inflation accelerating rate of unemployment. And we also need the additional statistics for the standard errors and for the degrees of freedom here. So we can enforce this using shift control enter, get our minus output and get our full sample blue Phillips curve that shows you the natural rate of unemployment at the intercept and the inverse relationship by looking at the negative slope of the graph. And we can apply the t-tests to figure out whether the coefficients are significant by calculating t stats, uh, dividing coefficients by the standard errors, dragging it across, and then converting t stats into p-values by using the two-tailed t distribution and inputting the absolute values of t stats here and the degrees of freedom from the line output over here. And we see that on the full sample, the relationship is significant. But what is the optimal breakpoint that gives us the best explanatory power overall? Well, there was a way to do that by just estimating the regular uh, Chow structural shift test on all potential breakpoints that could be humanly possible, but that's very time consuming and very computationally intensive. Here, there is a way to do that uh, with the help of dummy variable regressions and Excel numerical optimization tools. So first of all, we're going to estimate a linear regression with dummy variables that is coded using a variable that takes a value of 0 or 1, depending on whether we have passed our selected breakpoint. So if we stick with the breakpoint we identified in the previous video, that is 1930, in 1931 the UK went off gold standard, and that was a reasonable assumption to make, that the relationship between inflation and employment could change uh, after such a tremendous uh, change in monetary arrangements. So here we can code a dummy variable that would be equal to zero if we haven't passed our breakpoint, 
and is equal to one if we have passed our breakpoint. So if the year is less than or equal to our breakpoint, and we need to lock that over here, then return zero and return one otherwise. And here we can bottom right click it all the way down and see that the dummy variable is equal to one later on and is equal to zero at the very start before we reach 1931. So the first year after the breakpoint, the first year when the UK went off the gold standard. And also to estimate the difference not only in the natural rate of unemployment in the intercept, the difference in the level, we also need to uh, code somehow using this dummy variable the difference in the slope, the differential slope of the impact of inflation on unemployment. So here is the clever way how to do it. We can just multiply our W variable onto inflation and get zero if we haven't passed our breakpoint and just get the value of inflation if we have. And now what we can do is we can estimate our uh, regression with such interaction terms with this dummy variable and the interaction of this dummy variable with inflation and get the full picture without estimating two different equations and applying the Chow uh, F-test. Here we need to select a 5x4 uh, array and apply Linus with the same dependent variable, namely unemployment, and three explanatory variables, the dummy variable, inflation, and their interaction. And then we can input the constant, that is the natural rate of unemployment before the structural shift, and one for the stats to calculate uh, the standard errors and the R squared and the degrees of freedom. And we can close the parentheses, uh, enforce this formula using shift control enter, and get our Linus output. And we can then look at the graph and see that it is indeed the gray uh, post gold standard Phillips curve that we saw in the previous video. We see that the main difference is the intercept and not the slope, with slope in both subsamples actually being higher than the slope in the original sample. Uh, and we can still um, calculate uh, our t-stats and p-values. And here, uh, t-stats uh, and uh, respective p-values for the t-stats would actually have a very handy interpretation. They would show us whether the slope and the intercept has changed throughout time when we transition from one subsample into the other. And we see that the intercept indeed changed significantly. This is significant at 5% and it increased because the differential intercept is positive. It means that after uh, the UK went of gold standard, the natural rate of unemployment was higher than before, and the slope didn't really change much because this p-value is remarkably insignificant. And now we have to figure out whether the uh, overall explanatory power of the model with the dummy variable and the interaction is better than the explanatory power of the original model that assumes the same relationship throughout the full sample. And here we can apply just the usual restricted f-test. The restricted f-test shows you how much does the r squared, so a measure of the model's explanatory power, improves when you include more than one additional variables to your model. Because if you include just one variable, you can easily look whether it individually is significant and that would be enough. But if you include a set of variables together simultaneously, then you have to apply f-test just as you do with original multiple regressions. You use t-tests to check uh, individual variable significance, and you use the f-test to test for their joint significance. The analogy is very clear here. So for the restricted f-test, we need to figure out the change in the explanatory power of the model adjusted uh, for the number of additional factors we use. So the difference in r-squared of the long model with interaction terms minus the R squared of the short model with no interaction terms, divided by the number of extra parameters we have included. And uh, it's easy to see we have included two extra parameters, that is the differential slope and the differential intercept, or the dummy variable and its interaction with inflation, and that's our numerator for the restricted F-test. And the denominator of the restricted F-test is the amount of variance that is remained unexplained, so it's one minus the mu R squared for the long model, divided by the number of the degrees of freedom in the uh, long model, so 158 here. And you already see a lot of familiar figures and numbers from the original video on the topic, if you have seen it. So here we can apply uh, this formula using just enter and get an f-stat that's equivalent to the f-stat we have got here from our usual Chow f-test. So 
applying this particular method is equivalent to the classical chow f test. And we can use uh, this f test to get our p value exactly in the same manner by using the right tailed uh, f distribution. Again, we're using the right tail distribution here because we uh, expect that including additional parameters does not reduce our explanatory power, does not reduce our R squared. In fact, it just cannot mathematically. We want to see whether this improvement is statistically significant. So we input our F stat here as our X, our number of additional parameters as our first degrees of freedom, so two, again, a dummy variable in its interaction with inflation, and the number of degrees of freedom in the final model, in the long model, as our second degrees of freedom. Close the parentheses, uh, enforce this formula and get a p-value of 1.51, exactly equivalent to the p-value we have got previously using the classical Chow structural shift test. So why this uh, approach could be more flexible and could be better than the classical approach? Well, first of all, it uh, requires you to estimate two regressions instead of three, so some gain here already. But what is most important is that you can use numerical optimization to select this structural break so that your F stat is the highest and by extension that your p-value is the lowest. So you can select the breakpoint when the structural shift uh, could have occurred most likely. Because if we, for example, change this breakpoint here, not to 1930, but for example to 1941, uh, again, um, this is quite a relevant year for world history, we can see that the uh, relationship between uh, Phillips curves in various subsamples is completely different. We see that the uh, Phillips curve up to 1941 is much uh, much steeper and intersects the uh, x-axis at exactly the same point as the full sample Phillips curve. However, the uh, Phillips curve after 1941 actually changed direction and it's no longer downward sloping but actually slightly upward sloping. So here we can uh, select the breakpoint year so that our f stat is the best and uh, that would give us uh, more evidence that this particular year is the most relevant for structural breaks. How to do that? Well, we can get it done using numerical optimization tools in Excel, namely Excel Solver. So we can go to Solver and select our objective function to maximize or minimize. So here we just can maximize the f stat of our restricted uh, f test and we need to maximize that, so no change is required here. And we need to change only one variable, and this variable would be our breakpoint here, which is specified over here in cell H1. And uh, then we need to specify the constraints that we want this test to abide by. Well, first of all, we don't really want the test to select a non-integer year, because that's not how this model really works. So we need to add a restriction that the year number should be an integer. Then we need to add the restriction that this uh, year number should be within the bounds of our sample periods because it wouldn't make sense otherwise. So we can add the restriction that our year number should be less than or equal to the end of our sample period, so 2016. And we need to add a restriction that our year number should be not less than the start of our sample period, so greater than or equal to uh, 1855. And here we can actually apply the evolutionary solving method that would just uh, go through all potential years and select the one that gives us the highest F stat. So we can click solve here and wait until solver converges to the optimal solution. It can take quite a long time when you uh, use it um, when you use the evolutionary method, but it can converge to an optimal solution in reasonable amount of time. And we have got our solution here, and let's see uh, what it arrived at uh, in terms of the F statistic, whether it's much higher than our original one, and uh, what it implies in terms of the shape of Phillips curves on the two optimal subsamples. We can see that the F stat is a whopping 33, which is much higher than 4.3 that we obtained originally, meaning that the breakpoint is much more likely to occur in the year selected by Solver than in the year that we have pre-selected based on our uh, plausible assumptions revolving around the gold standard. Let's see what this year is, and this year is 1974. And 1974 is quite a relevant year for the UK macroeconomic history, actually, because from 1973 until 1976, the UK has experienced stagflation, 
a peculiar macroeconomic condition that combines high inflation, galloping inflation, that is higher than 10% per annum, with very high unemployment, that is a characteristic of a recession. And uh, the simplistic uh, Phillips curve, the uh, basic uh, interpretation that was uh, in circulation back then, did not uh, account for this particular uh, fact. So this is uh, very reasonable, uh, what our Chow test gave us, that 1974 could be the best breakpoint year possible. And if we look at uh, the Phillips curves um, before 1974 and after 1974, we can see that, first of all, the Phillips curve uh, after uh, 1974 is quite vertical, so it's um, pretty much neither upward sloping nor downward sloping, and it highlights the further developments in terms of uh, theory surrounding Phillips curve that in the long run, and if agents have rational expectations, the Phillips curve should be vertical, reflecting that inflation should not have any uh, impact on the rate of unemployment in the long run. So here we have got this pretty much vertical Phillips curve. And before uh, 1974, the Phillips curve was much steeper and uh, the natural rate of unemployment was much lower, as we can see here. And we can verify it by looking at differential intercepts and differential slopes, seeing that both of those coefficients are statistically significant at 1%, these p-values being very low, and these t-stats being higher in magnitude than 3%. Here we can see that after 1974, the natural rate of unemployment increased around 2%, and uh, the slope increased by 0.29 percentage points, meaning that as before the structural break in 1974, the slope was minus 0 0.27, meaning that a roughly uh, a 4 percentage point increase in inflation would reduce unemployment by 1 percentage point. Uh, the sum of these two is roughly zero, meaning that there is quite no relationship between inflation and employment after the stagflation episode in the UK. But there is still one issue that we haven't addressed yet. That is, why do we assume that there is only one structural break? Maybe there were more than one and maybe that would improve our explanatory power even further. How to account for that? Well, that should be the topic of our next video. As for now, that's all there is for the Chow structural shift test using multiple regression with dummy variables. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I'm eager to see any further suggestions for videos in business economics or finance you would like me to record. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel or consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you very much, and stay tuned.